Um, welcome everybody to this month's ESIP Interoperability and Technology Tech Dive webinar series. Uh, we record each of these. Alistair, I'm not sure I told you that. I hope I told you that. Um, is that okay? That's absolutely fine, yeah. Great, because actually, you know, especially for the more technical talks like this, sometimes we don't get a big turnout, but we get a lot of views on the recording, uh, the recordings that we share out on uh, on YouTube. So um, we're excited to have you here today. I just want to mention briefly that if you're not familiar the, with this web page here, you can find all of our previous uh, talks here, and you can see that actually we've had a number of, pro of talks that sort of are related to today's talk. And in fact, I just found out about Czar uh, in this talk at the ESIP winter meeting that Ryan Abernathy and Matthew Rockland gave, where they're talking about the Pangeo project. So Czar factored into that project and I found it, I uh, was really fascinated by it. And um, I don't think it is well known in our community, at least here in the US. And so um, luckily Alistair was, was willing to I give us a presentation on it today. So I think um, I will simply uh, turn it over to you, or maybe Annie, can you turn it over to Alistair to, for the presentation? Oh, and you know, actually, I always forget to thank Annie. So let me just let me just thank Esip and Annie for uh, helping to make this a smooth process and and making the recording and uploading it and all that. So thank you, Annie. Not a problem. So uh, I just put one other request if everyone that's not uh, Alistair, if you could mute your mics during the presentation. And then if you have a question, uh, just go ahead and unmute. So I'm, Alistair, I'm going to make you the presenter. OK. OK, you should be good to go. Great. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Brilliant. OK. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for the invitation to talk. Um, I uh, actually uh, went back through the web page today and, and uh, I watched most of the talk that uh, Matthew Rocklin and Ryan Abernathy um, gave earlier in the year. And so um, uh, I know a bit about um, what they presented and uh, I also, you know, I get very excited. I, I got very excited actually watching it because you know, they, they gave some fantastic demos of the kinds of things that you can do now if you bring together, you know, a number of the, the, the tools that are available from the from the computing ecosystem. And uh, th those are tools like Dask and Jupyter Hub and uh, X Array and also Zar. And um, so uh, what I thought I would do is just focus in on Zar and go down a level and um, uh, and try and um, give some insights into functionality at a deeper level and also um, what's going on under the hood. I actually thought that I would dare to um, just revisit one of the demos that uh, Ryan and Matthew gave because I thought it was really so cool. Um, and that was uh, this demo here, which they, which you, which I can run. So I'm actually, I'm going to try and run this um, off of the, the Pangeo Jupyter Hub site. Um, and uh, I don't know an awful lot about actually what's going on in, from a scientific point of view because I'm a geneticist, um, but uh, the, the really key points were uh, from this environment, I can um, launch a cluster of uh, compute nodes. I'm actually gonna try and make that a bit bigger, see if I can get away with that. Um, and uh, off of that, you get uh, this really nice dashboard. And uh, then you can connect to that cluster. Um, and then the key step, which probably passed, passed, passed you by if, you, if you're watching it quickly, but the key step that's going to link into today's talk is this step here. And this step here is where we uh, interact with data that is stored on Google Cloud Storage. So they, the Pangeo team have uploaded a, a data set into Google Cloud Storage, and they've uploaded it uh, using Zar. And then I'm going to, I'm not actually going to use Zar directly in this demo because I'm going to use X-Array, but X-Array knows how to talk to Zar under the hood. And so I can open a data set um, that is stored in Google Cloud Storage. And this is a data set that has been stored according to um, common data format as I understand it. So it's got uh, dimensions and um, 
various data variables, various coordinates. Um, and I can do some quick things with those data, like plotting this elevation map. But then you can also do some things which are a little bit more involved, like computing a spread of uh, temperatures across ensembles. And um, that's a little bit more of an involved computation, but when you kick it off, uh, Dask handles the parallelization and uh, movement data between the different parts of the computing workflow and um, the leverage for the analysis they do uh, in analytics. And so to be able to leverage these tools, tools like Dark has actually been a, a really big motivation for uh, to are we losing so it's just a while to pull through all of the sorry yeah i'm also having some audio where okay. your audio is getting a little choppy um it seemed when things started firing up on your machine that uh your audio started to get a little choppy so so maybe it's just okay. the animation though, because it may be the animation because of course these computations are not taking place on his machine so yes uh maybe uh maybe it's just the animation how is it now? Can you hear me okay now? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, so I promise you there will be, there will be no more animations <laughs> in the rest of this talk. So the demos, the rest of the demos are actually relatively boring and more technical. Um, but uh, but yeah, I thought it I thought it would be nice to just revisit that and and. Um, yeah, this is the same demo that made me say, "Wow!" I mean, uh, this is really uh, yeah. I need to find more about. Out more about this. I think it's... no, that's that's great. So, um, so to give you just the one slide summary of of, of what ZAR is, ZAR is a software library for storing data, primarily scientific data. Um, you can store your data as n-dimensional arrays, where each array has a fixed data type, and uh, to store the the data for each array, each array is divided into chunks, and then each chunk is compressed. Um, you can also, before doing compression, apply filters um, to the data. Uh, you can set various attributes on the data. Uh, and you can also organize your arrays into hierarchies. Um, and uh, there's a number of uh, alternatives for how you actually store the data. So the actual storage backend. So you can store your data in memory, or you can put it on local disk, or you can store data in the cloud. Uh, and there's also uh, support for parallel computing, obviously, as we've just seen. And there's a number of features that allow you to um, make uh, more complicated selections and, and retrieval from the data, too. Um, and so if you're, as I'm sure most people are familiar with HDF5, you'll recognize that this is, to a first approximation, this is uh, the set of features that HDF5 provides. And um, so ZAR is heavily inspired by HDF5. Um, but there's a few places where it differs, and the, 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 the parts that I've highlighted in bold here are areas where, the, where there are some differences. So in terms of compression, ZAR has uh, some more options for, for the different compressors that you can use with the data. Then in terms of storage alternatives, there are, some, there are more options there again for, for how, you can, how you can store the data. Also, there's some more flexibility for the types of parallel computing that you can do um, on data that's stored in ZAR. And uh, we've done some work on optimizing the advanced indexing as well. So that, that tends to be a bit faster. And so what I thought I would do with the talk is um, uh, just give a very quick use case from my domain, which is genetics, just to give us a, a, some data to have in mind. Then I was going to talk a bit about, uh, give, a, to give a demo of how you do some simple things like creating an array and reading and writing data. Then I was going to talk a bit about uh, what data types are supported and what compressors and filters are available and what the API is for compressors and, and, and filters in case you want to implement your own. Um, then I was going to give another demo to introduce how you work with hierarchies and also to introduce some alternatives for storing your data locally on disk. Uh, then talk a bit about the storage architecture and the API um, that each different storage subsystem implements. Uh, then I was going to give a, another demo of um, using cloud storage. Uh, I'm going to use S3 in that demo. And uh, then I was going to talk a bit about parallel computing 
and give another another sort of a bit more broken down example of parallel computing with Dask, and then wrap up with it with a few words about what, what specifications and documentations we've written and uh, what the current status of the project is. Okay, so just to give you a, a use case, and uh, so we, we have various uses for Zara uh, where I work, but this is sort of the, the, the real motivating use case. I work on the genetics of the mosquitoes that carry malaria in Africa, and uh, the best way of controlling malaria at the minute is to uh, use insecticides, either spray them inside people's houses or give people bed nets that are treated with insecticides. But the big challenge for malaria control right now is that pretty much everywhere you go in Africa now, if you if you catch mosquitoes, you'll find that they're resistant to the insecticides that, that we use. And so this is making our control efforts less effective. And the reason that they're resistant is because um, there are genetic changes. There have been mutations in their DNA, which uh, which gives them the ability to, to resist um, insecticides and and what we're fundamentally interested in doing is trying to identify those genetic changes that are responsible for causing insecticide resistance um, and so the way we do that is we collect mosquitoes from uh, different countries and different locations across Africa and then um, we bring those mosquitoes back to the UK where we sequence the genomic DNA from each mosquito and um, there's a bunch of pre-processing we have to do on those sequencing data but Ultimately, the data that we end up with looks a bit like this. So um, we have a one dimension for our data, which corresponds to all of the different positions in the genomic DNA sequence for each mosquito. Then we have another dimension, which corresponds to just each individual mosquito that we've collected and, and sequenced. And then mosquitoes like us actually don't just have one copy of their genome. They've got two copies, one inherited from their mother and one inherited from their father. So that gives us a third dimension to our data, um, and oops, and uh, the way we actually represent um, the DNA sequence for each mosquito is uh, using integers, and uh, we actually compare every mosquito to a sort of standard reference sequence. And if it's the same as the standard reference sequence, we give that a zero. So zero here means that all of these mosquitoes are the same as the standard reference sequence, and if they're different then we give them a positive integer like one or, or two. Um, and so the scale of the data that we're working with is uh, of the order of, there's about a well, about 100 million, um, the size of this first dimension is about 100 million, so there's 100 million um, positions in the genome that we're looking at. The scale of the second dimension, we've got data for getting up to about 10,000 mosquitoes, and then we've got this this um, the second dimension here. So that corresponds to about two trillion data items. If we just use a single byte integer for each for each item, that that's an uncompressed size of about two terabytes. But actually, because um, because most of the DNA sequence is the same between two different mosquitoes, there's quite a lot of zeros in this data. And, and that means that the data is sparse and it compresses relatively well. So the compressed size is about 40 gigabytes. And the, the types of things that we want to be able to do with these data, we want to be able to extract regions. So we want to take a slice across a row uh, of, of rows from the data, for example, load those data into memory, memory compute on them. Uh, sometimes we want to be able to look at a particular set of mosquitoes. So we take a slice across the columns. Sometimes we want to do both, a particular region of the genome, particular set of mosquitoes. Uh, also, sometimes we want to be able to extract data for some selection of rows uh, or some particular selection of mosquitoes or a combination of selection of rows and columns. Um, and that's just all uh, pulling out data to do analysis on. And then we also want to do various aggregations over the data. So a, a, a classic example is counting just across the columns, counting how many times you see a zero and how many times you see a one and so forth. And there's also other things like dimensionality reduction. So we want to be able to do things like principal components analysis, which helps us uh, understand some of the structure in this in this data. So uh, we use ZAR to store um, these arrays. And uh, let me switch over now to um, giving uh, some of a demo. Let me just make that big. So I've got a Jupyter Notebook server running. Actually, I've got it on a just a, a, a sort of modest server on EC2. Um, and uh, I'm just going to illustrate how to create an array. So 
if you just want to create an array to work with, um, then Zar has a bunch of array creation functions. For example, there's a function called zeros, and that just sets up an array um, with a default fill value of zero. Uh, when you create this array, you have to give it a shape. So the shape is just the size of each of the dimensions of the array, just like if you're creating a NumPy array. And in this case, a D-type here, the D-type is a 32-bit integer. And then if you're familiar again with, with NumPy, then um, ZAR arrays have some properties that are the same as what you would find on a NumPy array. So there's a number of dimensions. This is a two-dimensional array. Uh, the shape, the size of each of those dimensions, the data type. And if you uh, want a, a bit more diagnostics, there's an info property. So you can uh, get uh, things like uh, the shape, but also the chunk shape. So ZAR has, by default, broken the array into chunks. And, and I didn't specify a chunk size or chunk shape when I created the array, so it's it's guessed some uh, default for me. Uh, so this is the shape of each chunk. Each chunk is 6,250 rows and 63 columns. Um, also, I, I didn't specify what compressor I wanted to use, but it's used the default. The default is a compressor called BLOSK. And this is just some detail about the settings that BLOSK is using. Uh, the store type is a bit cryptic, um, but actually this store type actually means that the data are being stored in memory. So they're compressed, uh, but the compressed chunk data is being stored in memory in this case. Uh, the number of bytes uncompressed for this array is um, 100,000 times 1,000 times 4, which is um, uh, 400 megabytes. But uh, the actual number of bytes that are stored at this stage is 343, because all we've done at this stage is store some metadata. We haven't actually stored any data at all. And it is reporting a storage ratio, which is just the ratio between these two numbers. But that doesn't that's a bit meaningless at the minute, because we haven't actually stored any data. And you can see that we haven't stored any data, because zero out of the 256 chunks have been initialized at this stage. Um, so if you want to. Uh, store some data, write some data into this array, and then read data back out. The, the API for doing that is very similar to uh, the API for reading and writing um, data from a NumPy array or, or from H5Py data sets. So if you're familiar with those things, then it's, it's exactly the same API. Basically, if I want to set the same value into every single element of the array, I can take a total slice here and set the, set the number 42 into that total slice. Um, and just to take another look at the info now, the info tells us that now actually all of my chunks are initialized, 256 out of 256. And the number of bytes stored now is 1.6 megabytes. Um, so our storage ratio is very high, but that's unsurprising because I've stored the same value in every single element. So compressor is going to do very well um, in that case. And this is not a massive array. So actually, in this case, I could read out all of the data from that array and then put it back uncompressed into a contiguous block of memory as a NumPy array. So to do that, you just use the same um, suffix uh, notation. So that's taking a total slice and loading those data into NumPy. And so this is just the representation of the NumPy array. And you can uh, use that uh, slicing syntax to write data into regions so to write the data write some data into just a single row of the array i could do something like that and then to take a look at what i've done there let's just read data back out from the first thousand rows so you see i've i've set the data across um, the first row and this is just writing data um, into the first column and let's just take a look at what i've done there so then i've i've, I've written some data into the first column and i can write data into a square region of the or rectangular region of the array. So this is um, the first 10 by 10 region. I'm going to set the value to minus 1. And then just to take a look at what I've done there, I've, I've, I've set those values there. So those are basic um, array reading and writing operations. Um, and uh, I was then just going to illustrate some of the options that you can uh, use when you're creating arrays. And I was going to show you just using a couple of different um, filters and compressors. Uh, all of the filters and compressors that you can use with Zara are actually have actually been factored out 
just recently into a separate package. So there's a separate package called Num Codex, which is dedicated to providing filters and compressors um, for use with ZAR, and actually it can be used for other projects if, uh, as well, but primarily for use with ZAR. So I'm going to import Num Codex, and in this case, I'm I'm going to create a ZAR array, but from some pre-existing uh, data that I've got. So I'm just going to set up some um, data by um, using some uh, random uh, normal sampling. So I'm going to set up a, a, a data array, which has got uh, 10,000 rows, 1,000 columns, and it's a normal distribution with mean uh, 1,000 and standard deviation 1. So here are the data. And if I want to create a ZAR array from an existing um, NumPy array, I can use the, the ZAR array function passing in the data. In this case, I'm going to manually specify what I want the chunks to be. Uh, and I'm going to use a couple of filters on these data. So actually, uh, maybe I'm not too bothered about capturing all of the precision of these, of these floating point numbers. So I'm going to use a uh, fixed scale offset filter, which is just a simple filter um, uh, that basically rounds things to a certain level of precision. I'm also going to put a checksum filter in there. And then I'm going to use a different compressor. I'm going to use the Z standard um, compressor. And just to illustrate that, um, here's some info for that array. So in this case, I've got a storage ratio of about four, um, which is not bad for random normal data. And just to pull, the, pull some of the data back out and illustrate what's happened, just to show um, the loss of precision that has occurred due to the use of that particular filter. So now I've got my data to, to three decimal places. So um, let me just uh, give you a few more technical points about creating arrays. The data types that are supported are pretty much all of the data types I think you would expect, floats, integers. Um, complex numbers are supported in principle, although there's a bug with that at the moment. Uh, some time-related data types, you can have Boolean arrays. You can also have fixed length byte or Unicode strings, so each item is a fixed length byte or Unicode string. Um, you can have structured data types, so each item is, is, a, is a struct. Um, and there's also some support just recently for uh, having arrays where each item in the array has a variable size in, in memory. So uh, you can have variable length byte strings in an array. You can have variable length Unicode strings in an array. And you can also have an array, an n-dimensional array of variable length arrays, which is basically ragged arrays. So there is support for that now. Um, and the compressor codecs that are available currently from num codecs, uh, there is BLOSC, which is uh, not actually a compressor, but a meta compressor. So it manages um, compression in a way that allows multiple threads to be used. Um, and it internally uses a, 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 any of a number of compressors. So you can internally use Z standard with BLOSC or LZ4 or a couple of others. And in addition to uh, uh, enabling multiple threaded compression, decompression, it also has some um, really heavily optimized um, byte and bit shuffle filters internally, which can be very useful. In addition to BLOSC, there's also support for Z standard and LZ4, and then uh, Zlib BZ2 and LZMA via the, via the Python standard library. Uh, and just um, really as an illustration, um, I ran some benchmarks uh, on my data, my genotype data, to try and figure out which compression I, which compression options I should be using. Um, and uh, I don't think this is going to translate at all to what a different data set, because every data set is unique and, and tends to have different, different properties when you try and compress it. But uh, what I get in my data is that if I use BLOSC with LZ4 internally, um, I get a compression ratio of about 18 uh, times, which is not bad but I get very, very high throughput, so I can get compression speeds of over 10 gigabytes a second and decompression speeds of nearly eight gigabytes a second. That's going to and from main memory though, so that's just the raw decompression compression speed. But if I'm, if I'm perhaps going to a storage system which is not so quick, I might uh, go for an option where I've got a higher compression ratio. So if I use BLOSC with Z standard um, and I use the bit shuffle filter, 
I can get just I can get over 50 times compression ratio and I still get you know some some pretty decent um, compression decompression speeds so there's a lot of options to, to play around with um, there are a range of filter codecs that are available for example there's a delta filter a couple of filters for um, reducing precision um, and uh, packing uh, binary data uh, also dealing with categorical data and doing some checksums um, this is an area where actually um, a, not a lot of work has gone into optimizing these so these are I think there's scope for further work in, in this area particularly optimizing performance and there's a, a bunch of other um, possible code filter codecs that might be applicable um, which people might be interested in adding at some point and just to mention that the, the API for Codex is relatively simple. So if you want to implement your own codec, you basically um, subclass from this codec class. And there's two methods you need to implement, encode, which accepts a buffer of data or returns an encoded buffer of data, and then decode, which does the reverse. So you subclass this, and then you register your codec with a, with a function call. And then you can use your codec straight away. Okay, so um, let me skip back to the demo and uh, illustrate how you can build up hierarchies and uh, look at some alternatives for storing data locally. So to, to set up a hierarchy, there's a, a function, top level function, which is called group. So I'm just gonna create a group and that's gonna be the root of my hierarchy. And then the API here is similar to H5Pi. So to create a child called foo, I create group foo, and then to create another child within that, again, I'm just going to use the create group function um, method, sorry. And if I want to create an array within one of these groups, there's a, a, a method called create data set, which is the same as h5pi. You have to give this a name, uh, but then everything else is just like when we created an array before, things like a shape and a d-type. So that's an array, but it has a name now because it's part of a hierarchy. Um, also, uh, you can, you don't have to break this down into lots of different steps. If you can just, if you know you want to create something in a particular path, you can use a, a path expression like this to create a data set. Um, and there's, there's some convenience for uh, inspecting hierarchies. So a group objects have an info property, which tells you a few things like how many members they have how many array members, group members, and what the names of those are. There's also a tree method, which is new, um, but it gives you a sort of slightly interactive um, way of browsing through the hierarchy. And then if you want to access um, uh, different uh, objects from within the hierarchy, you use um, a notation like this. So that's pulling out the foo group, and then that's pulling out the the eggs uh, array from the hierarchy. And everything that we've done up until now has actually been storing data just in memory. But if you want to store data on your local disk, um, the way to do that is to first instantiate a store. And there's various classes um, for doing that. And if you, uh, I'm going to illustrate the use of the directory store, which just stores all of the data just down on the file system in a directory structure. So this is the path on the file system where the data is going to be stored. And I'm going to create a group now, but I'm going to pass in the store. And that's the only difference from what we did previously. And just to show you what's going on under the scenes, uh, if I just do a directory listing on this path in the file system, it has a file in it called zgroup.zgroup. That's a metadata file which just marks this directory as containing a group. And then if I do all of the things that I did before, you know, create some child groups and some child data sets, and then just look at the directory listing again. So this directory store is just creating directories on the file system which correspond to the logical structure of the hierarchy that we've created. So there's a mapping from the hierarchy just down to the directory structure. Um, and if we take a look at what's inside some of these things, that's the directory listing for the for a group. So it's got a dot, dot z group file in it. This is a directory listing for an array. So it's got a dot z array 
file in it, and that's metadata. Um, and then if I write some data into that array, and I'm just going to write some data into the first 1,000 rows, 100 columns, uh, which uh, actually will only write data into the first chunk of this array. And then I do a directory listing again. There's a new file here called 0.0. .0. That file has the data for one chunk of the array. And then if I fill the whole array up, so I, I set data for the whole array, and then I take a, a directory listing again, now I've got lots more chunk files in because I've written data to every single chunk. And the name of these chunk files corresponds to the position of the chunk within the grid of chunks. So 0.0, .0 is the top leftmost chunk, 0 0.1 is the next chunk to the right, um, and so forth. Uh, and just to just to also show you what what each chunk file actually contains because the, uh, it's very straightforward. So if I actually just manually open up one of these chunk files and uh, read in the data, the chunk file just contains the compressed data for a single chunk. Uh, there's no header. There's no or anything like that. All of the metadata are stored elsewhere, so you can just read it in. And in this case, you can just use the Z Zlib module from the standard library to decompress it. And then I can use NumPy to then interpret that back out. Um, and so I can I can just pull the data for a single chunk into a NumPy array representing that chunk. So um, I use directory store quite a lot. It's very robust. It uses atomic writes, so it's actually quite hard to corrupt data. Um, and it also means you can just use standard file system tools to inspect the data, move data around, and so forth. But um, you can end up with lots and lots of files on the file system, which can be a problem sometimes. So there's a number of alternatives for storing data locally now. And I was just going to illustrate one. Um, but uh, there's another class called LMDB store. And this allows you to store data, again, locally on the file system, but using the Lightning memory mapped database, which is a key value database. And again, it's exactly the same. The only difference is that now when I create my store, I use a different class to instantiate my store. But apart from that, it's exactly the same. Um, and I can create a hierarchy, store some data, and then just to illustrate what's on the local file system, this time on the local file system, I've only got two files. These are the files uh, which LMDB is using to, to manage the data. And LMDB is a bit scary because it will tell you that it's got a file that's that's one terabyte in size, but it's it's not actually one terabyte in size. Um, that's just to do with uh, how it uses sparse files, I believe. Um, but actually, I, I've still got lots of storage available on my disk. Um, so just to uh, just to walk through some of those technical details again. Um, with pictures, uh, and to give an example here, if I've, if I've got just a small array here, which has got shape 10 rows by six columns, and I set the shape of each chunk to five rows and three columns, then I end up with four chunks. Uh, and those four chunks are laid out in a two by two chunk grid. And then the way Zar identifies each chunk is it gives each chunk a key that corresponds, that is built from the indices of the chunk within the chunk grid. Um, and then when data is being stored for a chunk, so let's just take this chunk here, 0 0.1, the uncompressed data for that chunk will be passed in and then passed through any filters that have been configured and then finally passed to a compressor. And that will result in an arbitrary sequence of bytes with the encoded data for the chunk. And then that just gets passed to the store and is stored under the key um, for the chunk. So the store is just a mapping from chunk keys to sequences of bytes. That's all the store contains. And so this means that you can use any storage system with ZAR if it provides a key value interface. A key has to be an ASCII string, a value has to be a sequence of bytes, and the store has to be able to read uh, write and delete 
keys and values, but that's all it has to be able to do. And uh, actually, the way that's implemented in terms of the actual API, the storage API is equal to this thing in Python. So we haven't invented our own API for this. We've just reused an interface that comes from the Python standard library called mutable mapping. That just happens to be the interface that anything that is a, a bit like a Python dictionary in, uh, implements. So anything that is dicks like can be used as a store with SAR. And this, the, there's a number of local storage classes that are that come with SAR at the minute. So we've seen the directory store, we've seen the LMDB store. There's also a DBM store, so you can use uh, GDBM, NDBM, or Berkeley DB to store your data. And there's also a zip store, so you can store data directly into a zip file. And there's a couple of other variations on those. And uh, Alistair? Yep. I just, I just, I'm interrupting partly just to let you know we're still here, and this is awesome. Um, I right. have a, I just had a quick question about, um, so the metadata for uh, what kind of compressors and the other information, that's all in that dot, uh, dot whatever file you had there. Yes. So um, what I can actually do here is. Uh, what did we actually have there? That was a, it was a, it was a spam eggs. Was that array? Was that right? Okay, so here is the metadata for um, an array, and it's a JSON file. And so there's the shape, um, there's the D type, there's the compressor, there's the chunk shape. Um, here's the fill value. That that's that's the metadata. Perfect. Thanks. No problem. Uh, so um, yeah, so I was just going to then illustrate how you can use uh, remote storage um, or cloud-based storage. And so um, uh, ZAR doesn't provide itself any classes for, for using cloud-based storage, but the Dask project has provided a number of implementations of the mutable map mapping interface that, that sit on top of S3 or Google Cloud Storage. So I'm going to use the S3FS uh, module, which, which is part of the Dask project. Um, I'm going to create a, an S3 file system. And here, I'm going to create a store for use with ZAR, but this time I'm going to use the S3FS S3 map class, which is just um, another st equivalent storage class. And this is the bucket um, location. Um, and uh, before we try and use that with ZAR, we can just inspect what's actually in that store. So we could just take a look at what keys are present. Um, and so there's a bunch of data already in that store, which I was which I was playing around with earlier. So I can stick that straight into ZAR, into a ZAR group, and take a look at the um, hierarchy tree. One thing to notice here: as soon as we're starting working with um, remote storage, even no, I'm actually running this from inside EC2 from the same region. There's a certain amount of latency involved in pulling down metadata files and listing directories. So it takes a bit longer now um, to pull down this uh, this tree. But uh, we've got a couple of, of arrays in here. There's this Baz array. So um, let's take a look at that. Um, and this was just me testing that I could put some data in. So I put in a little array of single byte strings um, to give myself a little message. Uh, so that's reading out data that has already been set previously. Um, but then also just to illustrate setting data um, into an array, let's get rid of the eggs uh, array. And um, just to show that that's gone now, there's no keys corresponding to this eggs array uh, anymore in the store. So I'm going to recreate that. Um, let's take a look. No chunks initialized. Let's set some data into that array and, and see how long it takes. So this is not a massive array. And uh, so setting data here is relatively slow. Uh, and let's also pull out the data and see how long that takes. 
and again that was pretty slow so um, I think this is sort of a, a nice illustration of I think one of the or possibly the biggest issue that I think people are going to hit using network-based file storage is that there's there's latency and you know every time we need to make a round trip that costs some time and so there's probably more that we can do in Zara and there's probably more that the DAS project can do to try and optimize that but there's a simple thing we can try here uh, now which is just to to re recreate the the array but with bigger chunks and bigger chunks means um, less back and forward um, so let's get rid of that array again and let's recreate it this time with the same shape but I'm just going to make bigger chunks now so now now I've got just four chunks in my array as opposed to what I had previously, which was a hundred chunks. And so let's just store some data into that array and it's a lot quicker. And pull it back out again and it's a lot quicker. So um, let me just very briefly talk a bit about um, the support for parallel computing and how that works and then, and then open up to questions. Um, it, the desire to kind of have some storage, which was um, which really didn't get in the way at all of parallel computing, was one of the main reasons for for starting to work on Zara. Uh, and so it's been designed from the beginning to be used in parallel workflows. And by that I mean Zara arrays are, are designed to be used as the source or input for some parallel computation, and they're also designed to be used as the sync or output for, for some parallel computation. And so Zara arrays can have multiple concurrent readers. Zara arrays can also have multiple concurrent writers. Both multi-thread and multi-thread process parallelism are supported. So this means you can take advantage of multiple cores if you're just working on a single machine and doing some medium scale things, but you can also take advantage of distributed clusters for bigger, bigger tasks. Um, if you know about Python and you know about something called the GIL, um, that tends to kill parallelism generally if you're trying to do multi-threaded parallelism. But inside Zara and Num Codex, we release the GIL pretty much during all critical sections. So, so you do get um, some pretty good throughput uh, in multi-threaded as well. And it's generally compression and decompression that are the, that are the bottlenecks, and, and those are those all release the GIL. And just one thing to be aware of is that um, if you are writing, if you've got multiple writers into an array, you need to think a little bit about um, whether or not it's possible that those writers might come into contention with each other. And just to illustrate when that becomes relevant, so if it all relates to how your writers are writing into the array and how that maps onto um, how you've organized the data into chunks. And if all of your writers, each writer is writing a separate region, and the regions are aligned with the boundaries of the chunks, then there's never going to be any contention. And so you never need to worry about locking. But if you've got multiple writers that, uh, even though each writer is writing a separate region of the array, if those writes are not aligned with the chunk boundaries, then it's possible that two writers might come into contention for the same chunk. And so if that is possible, then some locking is required. And to support this case, Zar has um, support for uh, fine-grained locking at, at the chunk level. So it can lock and unlock individual chunks. Um, and so this means that you can have this kind of uh, setup. And also because the locking is fine-grained, you can still get pretty good parallel throughput. But I think uh, what I would suggest is to try and align your rights with chunk boundaries wherever possible so you don't have to worry about um, locking. And I'll just finish up with a quick uh, example of using Dask with Zar. Um, and I'm just going to load in Dask and a couple of bits and pieces. Uh, I'm just going to work locally from the file system. So I'm going to use a directory store um, and I'm going to set up a hierarchy. I'm just going to specify, I'm going to set up some input data for this computation. Uh, and I'm just going to say the input data is. Um, 500,000 rows, 10, 000, uh, 1,000 columns, sorry. Um, and I'm going to make the chunks big here, just, just really for demo purposes. Um, but I'm going to I'm going to uh, just create some random normal data as my input data. 
I'm just going to use Dask to, to do that for me. So I've created this array here called Z input, um, and I'm using Dask to store some uh, random normal data into my input array. But obviously, if you're doing this for real, that would be some real data. Um, just to show you what that looks like, uh, it's just some random normal numbers that are all centered around 1,000. And then I'm going to create a, a, a workflow, a pipeline, um, which begins with um, extracting data from the array. This doesn't actually do anything, but it starts to set up the pipeline. So I'm going to say from array um, on the input. And just to visualize that, here's the array. Here are all of the tasks that have been set up so far. So these are getter tasks. These are tasks that are going to pull data out for a particular chunk. In the second step, I'm just going to multiply my data by two. Um, so that's the second step in my pipeline. Just to visualize that, now that's just added these multiply, these mul tasks onto my task graph. And now I'm going to I'm going to aggregate. So I'm going to sum the data across that across columns across that first axis. Uh, and then to visualize that, that's added these sum tasks on. Um, and actually, we've got two lots of sum tasks. These are the sums within chunks. But because we've also got multiple chunks across the axis that we want to aggregate, I also need to aggregate across chunks too. So that's why there's two lots of sum tasks in the graph. And then finally, I'm going to create. I'm going to. I want to set up an array to store the output. So this is just an array um, that's of the right size and shape to store the output. And the final step in my pipeline is is calling this store method to store the output. And just to visualize that, finally, that's just added some store chunk tasks onto the end of the pipeline. And so let's compute that. And just to show you that the, the main thing here is that I've got, I'm just on a server that's just got two cores, but I've got 200% CPU pretty much all the way through. So I'm getting full uh, utilization of both cores on the computer. Um, and this is just to illustrate that I actually did create some data. There's some output there. So, um, that's basically it. Um, Zara is a Python library, but uh, we've also documented the underlying storage format uh, in case anyone would like to create an implementation in another programming language. And we've tried to make everything platform agnostic. So there is a, a specification document. Um, and the status is that uh, there's two core developers. There's me and there's John Kirkham. There's a number of contributors. Um, I'd just like to mention particularly Matthew Rocklin, Stefan Hoyer, and Francesc Alted, who have um, really been crucial in terms of providing advice and architectural ideas. So they've, they've um, really played a big part in shaping uh, where Zara has gone. Uh, the project is community maintained, so please don't get frustrated if um, we aren't able to respond as quickly as possible. Um, and there are periods of time when we need to do other things. So. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll we do our best, um, but we can't give it our full time attention. Um, we have put a lot of effort into trying to make the library as robust as possible. So it does have 100% unit test coverage, um, but it is still a relatively young project. Version one was 2016, and version two um, I just made a full release yesterday. Um, so I'm sure there's lots and lots of edge cases here which we just haven't encountered. Um, but if uh, you're interested in learning more, um, uh, there's a bunch of links. Um, particularly, um, there's a couple of nice blog posts that, that Matthew Rockland's published recently, one on the work he's done for the Pangea project, and also another uh, blog post discussing options for, for storing um, hierarchical and NetCDF type data in the cloud. Um, those are really nice. And just to acknowledge, again, that uh, all, so is very much inspired by HDF5, H5Pi, and also a library called Bcols. And um, the ZAR support in X-Array was implemented by Ryan Abernathy and Joe Hammond. And uh, the folks in the X-Array project are really the best people to speak to. Um, I haven't talked about NetCDF at all here, but they're really the best people to speak to about, um, about that. 
And uh, as I mentioned, the cloud object storage is part of the DAS project. So that's work that was done by Martin Durant and Matthew Rockland. And uh, I've taken a bit too much time, but thank you so much for uh, sticking with me. And I'd be very happy to take any questions. Wow, Alistair, that was that was fantastic. That was one of the most clear explanations of a software package I've ever heard. Oh, that's um, very kind. Thank you. Um, I'm sure there's going to be a few questions, folks. You guys are muted, but you can unmute yourselves, I hope. Um, who wants to go first? <laughs> you, are you folks being shy? I can't believe that there's no questions from me, the folks on this list. I, I can ask a question if you want, but. Uh. Um, I've got a, this is Dan Pallone. I got a real quick one. Um, that was that was awesome. Thank you for putting that together. Uh, with the S3, S3FS, um, how much does that affect kind of with the way S3FS is implemented affect your S3 performance? And does it support things like ranged reads for, for kind of scoped reads within the chunks? Um, so uh, because chunks are compressed, um, there isn't really a way of doing pulling out. If you want to pull out data from a part of a chunk, you need to retrieve the whole chunk and decompress it. Uh, and that's, okay. that's yeah. part of the, that's, yeah, that's part of the architecture. Actually, I mean, it is that there was a bit of a discussion at one point because some compressors do actually internally break things into blocks and so in principle could allow you to pull out smaller numbers of items without decompressing entire chunks but so far we haven't ever encountered a case where you know you'd need to be doing lots and lots of very small reads i think to to make it worthwhile investing in that so we haven't invested in that so far um uh, and um my understanding of the sort of big performance issues potentially with S3FS is, is it, it's going to be about minimal, as I mentioned, minimizing um, latency. And I know that, so when, when the Pangeo folks were first trying out Zara earlier this year, they were using Google Cloud storage, but very quickly they found there was a whole bunch of optimizations they could throw in, which would reduce the number of round trips. And I don't know how much that's been done yet on S3FS. So I, I, I expect there's quite a lot of scope for improving that. Okay. And then the chunk size is kind of integral in the initial setup of uh, the, the storage. So it's it's not something that can be tuned kind of for usage patterns, right? It really has to be based on the data being explored. Once the data is when the data is being written. Yeah. Well. So so what what I do, what we do is we. So I've done I've done a bunch of benchmarking, um, trying different chunk shapes, uh, performance under different usage patterns. And um, because as I, as I sort of, as I was showing at the beginning, we, we, we want to be able to pull data out, you know, row wise, column wise, pretty much any which way, what we end up with is a chunk shape that is a compromise between the different data access patterns. Um, but if you know ahead of time that, you know, you're only gonna access data in a particular way, then you can definitely tune your chunk shape to be, um, to be to, to perform better under those circumstances, and it will make a very big difference potentially. You, you know, you can absolutely destroy performance by choosing the wrong, the wrong chunk shape. Um, so yeah, it's very critical. Thank you. That's great. Hey, you're welcome. I'm Alistair. This is Rich. Um, I when I was looking at um, googling around on Czar and stuff, uh, looking for uh, possibility. You mentioned possibly other language implementations. There, there was something called Z5, yeah, which was which was. Do you know anything about that? It was, it was a C plus plus, was it? Or yeah. So so the so yeah. So this is a project that I think has just started, and um, it's a C plus plus implementation of both ZAR and actually there's so there's another project which kind of has, has been developed in parallel, but with very very similar principles and ideas, which is called N5. Um, and that was originally developed for use with Java. But this new project, Z5, is a C++ implementation that supports both ZAR and N5, because they're very similar. 
um, and that also has a Python front binding to it as well. But I think all of the all of the main the main work is done in C plus plus. So um, I'm following that. I think it's fantastic. Um, I think it's it's still very early. I think that the project's just got started. But um, I, I know that that I think probably if Zao was going to get traction, there would need to be either a C or C plus plus implementation. So um, um, ho hopefully, uh, unfortunately, I don't have the time to do that myself. But um, it would be great if someone does. Sure. I know that um, when Matthew Rockland talks about Czar, he often says, um, "But it's a new, it's, but it's a very new format that not many, yeah. many people have heard of." <laughs> so um, I hope that uh, you know this uh, this webinar and the recording will spread widely, and it won't be quite so uh, uh, poorly known. Uh, but uh, I think um, it does seem like. You know, folks are there's a lot of talks. If you go to like, the, if you went to the, you know, these talks like the, these uh, conferences like the ESIP Winter Meeting, you heard all sorts of approaches for people trying to store the data on the cloud. So it seems like it's certainly people people are looking for what are going to be the the formats that we start using if we if we stray if we stray away from HDF uh, files and NetCDF files. So I found this super exciting. Well, it's it's just it's just fantastic. If um if this if this is useful to this community, then I would just it, it will be it will be fantastic. I'd be very very excited. Uh, hey, Rich or Alistair, this is Ted. Sorry, I was trying to get my first question in, but I was muted, so uh, uh, <laughs> you guys didn't hear me. But um, in terms of the groups, so the if I understand it, a group is just a in in the file system implementation. A group is just a file. That has a dot z group file or a z group file in it. That's right. Yeah, yeah. and that, and that file is a JSON file that has the metadata for the group. That's right. Yep. And and I'm presuming that that or I would guess that the the group structures can be. I think you only showed uh, sort of one um, one level, but. A group can include other groups and data sets as well, right? That's right, yeah. And and what about user uh, metadata? I mean, in I I'm I'm uh, I work at HDF, so I'm fairly familiar with HDF. And and this this metadata that you're showing on the screen right now, I guess I would think of uh, we would call that um, or I would call that HDF metadata. It's sort of yeah. metadata about the data objects. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, can you also have user metadata um, inside yes. of these things? Yes. Yeah, so if if you so so Zara has the same API for setting user attributes as H5Py, and if you do set user attributes, then they end up in a a, a separate file called .zattrus. But that's a JSON file also. So if you do set any attributes, you'll end up with another another file. So if you set attributes on a group, you'll set, end up with another file that's next to this one called dodzattributes. And it's the same for arrays. You'll end up with another file, JSON file, with the user attributes in it. And are the are the types of those attributes? What what types can those attributes have? So it's because it's JSON, they can only be things that JSON is happy with. Um, and so if you want to store anything that isn't a number or a string or a list or a dict, then um, you need to do some encoding. So uh, for example, I know that some of the work that is in X-Array, they use attributes heavily to store you know, the CDF type metadata. And in some cases, they do some encoding uh, in their code. Before they before it gets to Zar so to encode values as base sixty four for example, so it's it's more limited than HDF five in terms of what you can just chuck uh, straight into um, JSON without doing some encoding. Um, okay, one other question in terms of um, a lot of uh, a lot of users in 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 these. Um, in these hierarchical data format land, regardless of, or even in directory structures, uh, like to sort of see the hierarchy. 
So is there an easy way to uh, take one of these czar files, which is really a directory, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of the directory structures, um, to take that and sort of uh, make a hierarchical display? I mean, basically you need to traverse the directory structure. I mean, in terms of the cloud storage, that's sort of what we're thinking about now in terms of making things um, rather uh, sluggish is the retrieval of, yeah, the structure. Okay, that was the tree function, yeah. Uh, to, um, to construct that, that tree in, in, the, in the cloud storage can be sort of slow. Yeah. Especially, you know, we have yeah, so actually, we have products that have hundreds of groups. Yeah, yeah. So, so actually, if if you try and do this, so this this was done against local storage. If you try and do this against cloud storage, it will get very slow. And actually, the reason right now that it gets very slow is because it's not only pulling out the the, the, the hierarchy, but it's actually pulling out some metadata for each array to be able to display it. And so actually it's got to read each of the array metadata files too. Uh, and I, so there's actually an open issue to, to look at this um, uh, and see if there's a way. I think it, it, if you don't pull out any array metadata, then all you need is a listing of all of the keys in a bucket. And that from that you can construct um, the, uh, the hierarchy. But so I think this could be improved, but, but I think it's still, it, it's for cloud storage it's definitely going to potentially be slower or less scalable than than other storage um i have one other question is that okay please if, if, i mean or does someone else want to ask a question um yeah. okay here we go last one um yeah one of the things that that we've been uh, dealing with for a long time in earth science world with OpenDAP, and I'm glad to see James here, is uh, the sort of array index retrievals. And, you know, Stefan's done a bunch of stuff, you know, to try and um, take that away. Um, do you think uh, it might be interesting to, uh, instead of saving the, uh, the chunk indices, um, in uh, in chunk coordinates to save those in uh, natural coordinates. I mean to to integrate natural coordinates into the uh, into the keys for the chunks. Have you thought about that at all? So um, I'm I'm not quite following. So this um, by natural coordinates, you mean what do you mean by natural coordinates? Well, in, in our case, in Earth science, in a lot of cases, those natural coordinates are latitude and longitude. Oh, I see. Or latitude I see. and longitude and time. Okay. Uh, so you mean if you want to be able to say, give me all the data between, you know, latitudes 10 degrees and 20 degrees north or something, rather yeah, right. than give me all yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, that's a very common. I mean, I realize that your mosquitoes. Uh, <laughs> you know, mosquito number seems to be a natural coordinate there, but um, yeah. in in the geospatial, geospatial and temporal Earth science data, yeah, you know, we, you know, we're trying to think about how how to connect the chunks into spatial indices, things mm -hmm. like um, in uh, in Esri land, things like um, uh, mosaic data sets and stuff like that. Okay. Um, so we haven't thought about doing something specifically within ZAR to support um, indexing. What what we do with the, the genetic data is that we have, I think, what you would call coordinate variables. So we have um, another array which has the coordinates for every uh, row. Um, and mm -hmm. that's small enough that you can load that completely into memory and it's also sorted so you can do binary searches on it so we have a step and i think it's basically what x array does is it has this step ahead of time where you load your index arrays in and you construct data structures that allow you to do efficient searching on your index arrays and then 
from the user point of view, that's hidden. So the user's still asking, give me all the data between a, a pair of latitudes. But internally, that's doing some sort of binary search, whatever, on an index array, mapping that to then the actual coordinates yeah. um, in terms of array space. And, and so that's a sort of, it's a handled at another level. And at, when you actually get down to the level of the storage, it's all, it's all come down to, to um, you know, row indices and column indices. <coughs> so that, that's how we've been doing it so far. But I know other projects have tried to integrate, um, you know, indices more, more, more directly. I think, you know, pi, pi tables is probably another example where they've done a bunch of work to try and do indexing. So, you know, very, very happy to explore ideas if, if there's better ways of doing it. Cool. And in, in X-Array, is Z, Z, is Zar just implemented as an engine in X-Array? I think it's, I think they call it a backend. So okay. it's, it's implemented as a backend. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, great. Um, thanks so much, Alistair. That was, that was fantastic. And, uh, please, uh, folks, you can spread the word, um, about the recording, which Annie will probably have up, uh, sometime tomorrow. So, uh, thanks again to Alistair and everyone for showing up today and we'll, um, we'll see you in a month. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure.